Full house. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, everyone in, in the audience. Uh, the subject of this is typically how American films have, have influenced them, but I, I'd, I'd like to um, keep this a, a little bit more flexible since uh, the the barrier between what is an American film and what's a foreign language film seems to be rapidly disappearing. We've seen a uh, French actress and a French actor win Best Actor and Best uh, Actress at the Academy Awards in the last few years, something that didn't even happen in the heyday of the uh, the French New Wave. So suddenly there's a lot of uh, crossover, and uh, you'll see certain American cameos, uh, at least in the Closing Night film. Um, the uh, I'm, I'm going to first ask Daniel Thompson, if I could, who has such a distinguished pedigree and certainly comes from a very distinguished family. Um, could you talk just a little bit about the role that American genre films played in in your life and in your growing up and, and certainly in your career? Um, what has, has Hollywood been kind of a mirror of um, your expectations? Has it in any way influenced you or do you sort of feel like uh, like French films need to have, in your career at least, have defined themselves perhaps contrary to American films? How has how's that relationship been for you? Wow, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> 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 well, um, I was brought up uh, in a family of actors. My father and my mother were actors, and uh, and this was in the 50s in Paris. And I was very lucky because I was always taken as a child to see uh, American movies in English, which was unusual at the time. In fact, I had a very bad reputation at school because... Uh, you know, my, my, my little girlfriends kept on saying, you know, when you go to her to, to stay with her on the weekend, you know, they always take you to the movies, and that's very bad education. This is a long time ago, but this is the way it was. So, yes, of course, American films were, uh, have been part of, of my life always. Uh, all films, but, you know, also at the time, English films and Italian films, they're less and less now that are coming to France, and they're less and less made, in fact. And this is something... This is an issue that we should also talk about because we are as survivors of the French uh, f film industry in Europe uh, compared to all these films then in the 50s that, and the 60s that were very alive and, and, and have slowly, slowly disappeared. Um, so I feel, of course, uh, you know, that then I came to America to live uh, for, for a few years and uh, it, it, it's it's always in in uh, in my uh, in my way of work. I guess it's whether it's conscious or not. It it's there because it's it, it it's been uh, it, it's it's been part of our lives. And I think probably all of us here have have had uh, this this. Um, uh, I, I it's 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 a mixture of a of, of a dream world that American films have brought to us. And, uh, and also, uh, I suppose, also a reaction, because we, of course, have never had and will never have, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the financing for huge, uh, incredibly, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the, all, all those huge productions with special effects and, and amazing films that, that some are wonderful, some are not. But I mean, you know, we're, we're not capable in France of, of, of making films like this. So we go to see these movies and, you know, like children, thinking, you know, we're not going to do this, so we're going to do something else. And the something else is, is really what you're all going to see this week because the, the, there's many, very different uh, sensitivities in what you're going to see this week. But they're all very French in the sense that I think all the movies you're going to see this week really talk about people and not about uh, things that happen, but about deeply about people, I think. This is the way we survive in, in, in our movies. Well, there's, a, there's a quote that I'm very fond of, which is a Milos Forman quote, which is that in Europe, filmmaking is about uh, soul-searching first and entertainment second, if at all, whereas in America it's about entertainment first and soul-searching second, if at all. Which, uh, That's what I was trying to say. Okay. <laughs> Milos. That was much better. Milos. Much quicker. <laughs> Shout out to Milos. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the subject of financing because that seems to be something that is, it really does separate still uh, European films, especially French films, from American films. 
even though American films are typically now struggling to put their financing together in that kind of co-production way. Uh, Ziad, if you could start this discussion, and I'd like some of the others to, to chime in as they could. Your film is a massive co-production of uh, four countries, France, Belgium, um, Qatar, and Lebanon, as, as I understand. Could you talk about how uh, difficult that was, or how easy it was, perhaps, to put that together, and... and how that contravenes certainly the way that things are done in America. You've worked on American films as well, so you have some perspective there, I think. Uh, the attack was uh, tricky. It took us several years to pull this film. The difficulty actually is the subject matter, because um, I mean I knew from the beginning, the second I was going to get involved in making a film that deals with the Middle East in Arabic and in Hebrew we don't have a lot going for us. Because it's just, you know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I had a great book and a great novels, and I was originally commissioned by an American company to do it. And I was actually very surprised when that American company called me in Beirut saying, we're interested to develop this film. And I was, when I flew to New York to meet the president of this company, which is a very, very big company, by the way. I'm not allowed to mention the name because I had signed a confidentiality agreement. But when I sat with him, I reversed the question to him. I said, how come you, an American producer, want to do a film that has no American actor, no American side to the story, it's not in English, and it's about a very thorny subject that deals with the Israeli... I mean, it's not the main thing, but the context of the film is Israel and Palestine. He says, it's something that I'm holding at heart. I really care for the subject. And um, I was shocked, to tell you the truth. I've never anticipated to sign a contract with a big company fast as one week. I flew back to Beirut, started writing, and nine months later, the film completely fell apart. They did not want to finance it anymore. As of today, I still don't know the reasons why they pulled out. But then a French company stepped in, and they said, we want to do the script, and they started looking for financing. At that time, a year and a half ago, the country of Qatar, just came out with an idea. They wanted to establish uh, contact with the Tribeca Film Festival and make a film foundation. And they have a lot of money. They put a billion dollars to finance film from the Arab world. So we pitched them. They gave us a good size of the money. I mean, the budget is very small, but they gave us about half of it. Egypt came in. They wanted to work with me. They gave us some money. And then we got a little bit of France and a little bit from Belgium. We went and we did the film. We shot it in Israel and Palestine. And just a few months ago, <coughs> the film was in Telluride and Toronto. The Qatari came in, they saw the film, they took her out after the screening. They took me and the French producer to the site. And he says, how much it cost to remove our name from the film? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we asked for a lot of money, actually. <laughs> I know. So they paid us right away, and we went, and we had to go back to the lab and pull their name out. About a week later, the Egyptian producer, who put about 25% budget, she said, why in the film did you show what Palestinians do to Israeli children, but you did not show what Israeli do to Palestinian children? I said, that's not the story. They said, why are you showing so much the Israeli side it went on on a debate, which I was expecting. She says, I will not release the film unless you take my name off the film. So, <laughs> we the we took, so for you tomorrow, you're going to see the film. You will not see the two main financiers. Why? Is the question. I flew to Qatar after that, and I met with the president of the foundation. So can I ask you something? Out of principle, you guys are advertising all over the world with the Tribeca Film Festival that you want to help film from that region of the world. You want to be at the forefront. You have Al Jazeera and so forth. Why now are you pulling out? And he said, we have nothing against the film. It's just that Qatar is being heavily scrutinized at this time because we are involved in the Syrian debacle right now, in the Libyan thing. If we are seen that we have any kind of sympathy toward the Israeli, which your film could show that, we are going to be scrutinized a little bit more. I said, I asked him, I said, I understand your concern, but we're into movie making. We're not, you're, you're taking a political decision. And he said, you're looking at the tree. We're looking at the forest. We cannot do this right now. I said, I don't mind you pulling your film out, but that goes against everything you've said. When you establish and publish, publicize all over the world that we're here to help film. 
I said, how about if I approach the Tribeca, your partners? Well, Tribeca did not want to get involved either because it's a political decision. We got away with Klein. I mean, I managed to do this film. I'm very happy with it. But it just tells you how much the Middle East is a very sensitive subject, how much precarious it is. And, you know, this is how it goes. This is how films from that part of the world have to go through. Etienne, uh, do you have any easier time <laughs> as a producer and a writer? Uh, you mean with the... Uh, well, putting, <laughs> putting films together as a producer, well, that, that sounds more, like... It's more simple, yeah. because of him, you know, um, about the food. And so <laughs> everybody likes to eat all over the world, and many people of the world, French food. So, um, no, but... I, I understand what what you've said also because before that I, I produced another film, which was a quite political also, what was of God and men and uh, question of uh, of um, you know relationship between uh, you know Europe and uh, Middle East, quite a way uh, North North Africa, and there was some question raised like, like that also, not not in the final thing but uh, regarding the the treatment of the subject. Uh, but for for uh, for old cuisine, uh, no, it's um, it's quite completely different, and um, I th I think also regarding what was saying uh, Daniel that uh, our strength also in France is to, to 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 speak also very much about very local thing. When when you are very local, sometimes you you can reach international audience because you 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 you, you speak about your own specificities. And um, the film has not been very complicated to, to, to raise the funds. But um, that's, you know, one, one film is like that, the other one is different. So each film has a special case. So you, you can't say, you know, before to, 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 to start the production of the film, which, which, what, what would be the difficulty about the film? Now, with respect to haute cuisine, what I find interesting there, Weinstein picked the film up. Uh, for distribution, and that's usually now in this very, very thinned out distribution environment, that sort of says, we think your film has real commercial American appeal, which, which is interesting because it's a subject uh, that seems, you know, very, very French. Um, and I, I, was there ever any intention in the, in the making of the film thinking this has real international appeal? Because it's a really, it's a very French story, it's something that's very uniquely cultural, but um, were you thinking internationally at the time? Um, we, we thought, uh, was, uh, when we interested with, with the subject with Christian Vincent, the director, we were really surprised in fact that in France there was not a lot of film talking about what is one of the specificities of France, the food. I mean, the, the best film who spoke about the, the, the French food is Ratatouille. <laughs> La Grande Bouffe, an Italian director. Uh, Vatel, made by an American director, but in, in English. And there was not a lot of, you know, uh, classic uh, film about, you know, uh, gastronomy, the pleasure of the food. So uh, it was a real, you know, first, not a surprise, but a quite well, you know, uh, place to be and to, to be with the film. So um, we were a little bit conscious about that, the fact if it was very well uh, done what Christians do with the film and with emotion. Uh, we thought about the Festin Babette, the Babette Festin, Babette's mm -hmm. feast. the Babette Feast, which is made also by the German, you know, director. So, Danish, Danish. 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 yeah, Danish. And uh, so, I'm not surprised at the end, you know. Uh, the thing about uh, the, the Winston company is, in fact, Harvey Winston told me that his mother. Is a great fan of French food. Who is it? And <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's only that also for, it's, it's, the film is very important for his mother. Wonderful. <laughs> and for uh, Philippe and for Lambert, um, I'm curious why did it take this long for us to find out that uh, that Lambert and uh, Fabrice Lucchini have such amazing screen chemistry? I feel like we've been robbed of one of the great screen teams of all time up until now. Um, it feels almost like, uh, you know, the odd couple. It feels, it, it, there's just an extraordinary chemistry there. 
Um, could you talk? It feels like a great American comedy team. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wonderful dynamism in the film. For those who haven't seen it, please see it. Could you talk a little bit about the extent to it? Because I could also say, well, it feels a little bit like Depardieu and Pierre Richard, that there's a great French comedy team there. Could you talk, uh, relative to the subject here, um, just how much the film's sensibilities and the, the, the characters are influenced by perhaps an American sensibility, a French sensibility, or something in between? Well, for a long, for a long time, my... my major influence was uh, American cinema. Uh, I, I grew up watching film uh, by Hitchcock and Billy Wilder and all, all the great masters and, and more closely like Sidney Lumet or of course uh, Coppola and Scorsese. And, and you, you may notice that among all these names maybe half of them are European. And of course uh, American cinema is, is built with uh, European uh, characters and sensibility. And it took me a while to to admit that I was French and uh, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't make American films and uh, that uh, I should go back in my tree uh, there's, a, there's, there's a, a, a word by Jean Cocteau saying that a, a bird, an artist is like a bird who, who's got to sing in his, in his L'arbre généalogique. I don't know how, how you would have yes. it. Genealogic tree. tree. And, and I felt th this feeling very, very, very strongly. And, and I think my two last films, uh, Women on Sixth Floor and Cycling with Molière, really <coughs> um, had their roots in uh, French sensibility. Not only because I, I use uh, Molière and, of course, the reference of theatre, but also because I think the tone of the film is very, very French. But in a way, my film is also a buddy movie, like uh, 48 Hours, like uh, the contrary, the, the, the mixing of two characters, wonderfully well played by uh, Lambert here and, and Fabrice Lucchini. And uh, in a way, of course, American cinema is always there, floating in the mist of the film. <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that um, French actors and I think actors all over the world are influenced by American actors and by, by especially within the field of comedy. So if you see a couple on the screen that works, um, if it works, like you, you say it did in, in, in Psyching with Moliere, um, I think unconsciously we absorb something that we consume in American films on television. So it can be positive, so it gives us certain acting references which are, I think, good, um, and they really directly come from America, I think, but sometimes it's bad. So you have entire generations of French actors that are influenced by TV acting, um, cliché, um, mimicking m uh, um, expressions that you see in commercials, that you see, I mean, you see, it's very... Um, clear, for instance, with young people, uh, young actors, they, they actually uh, enact something which is not part of our culture, which is completely absorbed from American culture. So um, I find that really disturbing. However, I, as a young actor, was only obsessed by American films. I wanted to become an American actor. I, my, my idols were American. I would only see uh, American films. And I complain now as a French actor that uh, young people, well, they don't go to see films anyway in cinemas anymore. That's one thing. And they just watch their computer. But anyway, uh, they used to go and see uh, only American films. And uh, as an adult, as an actor, as a professional actor, I complain about that because I was involved in French films and I, I wanted them to see French films. Whereas, as an adolescent, I used to go and see American films. I used to see catastrophe films. I used to see, you know... Um, big catastrophe films and, and, and uh, also films with uh, political films. Um, so um, there is an incredible influence, which is both fantastically positive and at the same time can be a little destructive in the way generations of actors um, act on screen now. Now you and your first film was Julia, if I'm not mistaken. My first day on a film set was was in front of Jane Fonda, yes, uh, uh, directed by Fred Zinnemann. Which was also Meryl Streep's first film. Yeah. It, was it was indeed, yeah. it was indeed. Yeah. Uh, um, and at the end of the day, Jane Fonda um, turned to me and she knew that it was my first day on a film set ever and she, she wished me luck. And I thought, my God, 
Chain Fund is pushing me like, you know, this is incredible. So I just <laughs> held on to it, you know, and, and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, uh, Lou, if we could pass to the next generation of, of actors. Um, let's, uh, if you could talk just a little bit about um, what it's like being an actor right now, because, the, you know, you've made five films, and two of them are here this year at Cocoa. That's a pretty great way to begin a career. Um, has, has your, talk about your influences vis-a-vis -vis French films, American films, what the, the landscape of film is right now as far as it inspires you. I think that at the end of the day, uh, the generation of actors is not that different, my generation, from the one of uh, Monsieur Lambert. Parce que, enfin, je vais parler en mon nom, mais les comédiens de ma génération aussi, on est très inspirés par les acteurs américains, par les films américains, par euh, leur sens du rythme, dans, par tout ce qui les voir, comment ils créent un personnage, tout ça, c'est quelque chose. Uh, no, no. <laughs> so it is the same way for my generation. We are extremely influenced by American actors, their sense of rhythm, um, and we are completely uh, enamored from uh, American cinema as well. And I speak for myself, but I think it's the same for uh, other French actors. Mais bon, après, euh, contrairement à, à, à... Je ne suis pas... Je ne pense pas... Euh, Devenir forcément une actrice américaine un jour. Je But I don't pas. think I'm going to become an American actress one day. On verra bien, mais c'est une source d'inspiration, comme tous les cinémas. Après. We shall see, but uh, you know, it's a, definitely a source of inspiration. But as are other uh, film as well, as from other places. Uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, a question with respect to your film, which is so interesting to me on so many levels because it is, it's so French, it's based on a Victor Hugo novel, but a novel that has only been done previously by a German director in the silent era, and yet it's a film that is considered widely to be the inspiration for the greatest villain in American comic book history, The Joker. Um, that is a fascinating cross-cultural axis that you're dealing with. So talk about how you had, how you got into, into the position, to have the courage to, to wrestle this material into a film. Sorry, it's difficult for me to speak in English. I speak French, but... Faire présenter et faire l'homme qui rit est très lié à mon adolescence et à mon amour du cinéma américain que j'avais à ce moment-là. So, uh, to do uh, The Man Who Laughs is really related to my um, years as a teenager and my influence of American cinema. Quand j'avais 15 ans, j'ai été très complexé, encore maintenant, mais quand même par mes deux maîtres. So, when, when I was 15, I had a lot of conflicts, <laughs> and just still, still today. Et je lisais, je lisais, et je n'aimais que les histoires de monstres, en fait, auxquelles je m'identifiais. And uh, I, I, lo I read a lot, but I really identified mostly uh, monster stories. Et tout ce que j'aimais aussi, c'est comme j'étais mal dans la vie, c'est au cinéma que j'ai trouvé un abri, il n'y a qu'au cinéma que j'étais bien, et j'aimais tout particulièrement ce cinéma de studio et ce cinéma fantastique américain qui vous faisait entrer dans un univers qui faisait à la fois un peu peur et qui vous protégeait. So I was completely fascinated by the world of cinema and uh, by this kind of world that uh, I think I felt protected in. Mm. Tu as dit autre chose que j'ai oublié. Protégé, tu sais. Ça faisait un peu peur. J'aimais les films qui faisaient un peu peur et qui en même temps nous protégeaient. Yeah. I love movies that scared me, but at the same time I felt protected. Et dans l'homme qui rit, c'est ce que j'ai essayé de retrouver ce sentiment adolescent d'un cinéma qui est de studio et qui à la fois fait un peu peur et qui en même temps nous. nous So, and in The Man Who Laughs, I try to find the same feelings as an adolescent and of something that is scary, but at the same time protects me. Mais l'histoire de ce roman de Victor Hugo est très liée, en effet, au cinéma et à l'art américain. Yeah, the story of Victor Hugo, The Man Who Laughs, is indeed very much connected to uh, American uh, movies. Il l'a écrit en 1869, alors qu'il était en exil à Guernesey. So he wrote it in 18... what? 
1869, where he was in the isle, he was exiled in the Isle of Guernsey because I think he was speaking against the French government at the time. Il s'était opposé à Napoléon III, notamment yeah. sur la question de la peine de mort. So he was also against um, death penalty, death penalty, and he was um, also opposed to Napoléon III. So that's why he went into exile. Et quand le roman est sorti en 1871, il a été très mal accueilli par la critique et n'a eu aucun succès public en France. So when it came out in uh, 1871, it was very badly received and had absolutely no success in France whatsoever. Comme mon film. Like his movie. <laughs> <laughs> Mais après, il a eu une influence incroyable donc sur le cinéma américain puisque la première adaptation est un film magnifique d'un réalisateur allemand, Paul Lenny, en 1928 à Hollywood. So, but it had an incredible influence on American movies, and the first, um, and on movies in general, the first movie was by a German director, Paul Lenny, and it was in uh, 1928, right? 1928. Okay. Et Paul Lenny en a beaucoup souffert, parce qu'en revanche, on ne l'a pas laissé faire la fin du roman, qui est une fin tragique, à la Romeo et Juliette, on lui a imposé un happy end. So he was very unhappy because he was supposed to do a happy ending instead of the real story, uh, like in the book, which is not as happy. Et ensuite, les créateurs de Batman, Bob Kane, et ont inventé le Joker en s'inspirant et du film et de l'homme qui rit de Victor Hugo. Yeah, so the people, uh, you know, the Batman creators were inspired by Victor Hugo, the, the man who laughs when they did the Joker. Et on le retrouve ensuite dans James Elroy, dans le Dahlia Noir. A Black Dahlia as well, James Elroy. Et des cinéastes que j'admire, et comme Tim Burton a toujours dit qu'il aimait beaucoup euh, l'homme qui rit et avait voulu euh, l'adapter. So Tim Burton also loved that, uh, that book, uh, The Man Who Loves, and actually wanted to make an adaptation, make a movie out of it. Il doit se demander qui est cet inconnu français qui, qui l'a fait. He's wondering who is this unknown director in France who made this movie that I wanted to do. <laughs> I'd like to go straight down the panel, if I could, and just really quickly, um, I'd like for each of you to talk about, certainly I'd like for the filmmakers to um, talk about what, what made you want to make the film, or to be involved in the film itself, what the, the precipitating idea was, um, and um, what you, how, to what degree you feel like uh, you were able to realize your vision, given all of the constraints that you face as filmmakers in an international marketplace. Um, Ziad, if we could start with you. We, you meant uh, Just what made us want to make that movie? Or the, the, this movie, the, the movie in particular here, that's called Koa this year, that in your case, The Attack, that what, what, what was the inciting inspiration, the urge, what, what drove you to do it, and are you, you know, obviously I'm not going to say, do you, do, are you dissatisfied with the result, but Given the constraints of the marketplace, do you feel like the the environment has allowed you to fully realize the film that you originally wanted to make? I had a great book. Okay. It's uh, the author is a French author by the name of Yasmina Kadra, and uh, he just to give you a little bit very quick, Yasmina Kadra is a very established novelist, but he was a high colonel in the Algerian army, and he was uh, working for like one of the most secretive part of the army. He was uh, service de renseignement, how do you say? Secret service. Secret service. He was in the secret service, and his job was to, this is only 20 years ago, his job was to track Islamists and put them through grilling interrogation tests. So when you read the book, the guy knows what he's talking about. And he's always remained my favorite part of the book is the interrogation scenes. And they come from really an innate experience this guy had. Well, this American production contacted me and they sent me the book. I was very reluctant, as I said. Did not want to deal with anything with the Middle East. It was a depressing time, you know, four or five years ago. We had, we had enough. I, wanted to, I want to go back to the States, actually, because this is where I lived half of my life, right in the city. And then, you know, the agent said, read this book. You know, they want you, they're interested. I said, I'm not sure. And she said, just read it. I took the book, and I was living in Beirut, sat down at, at a coffee shop, and I really was so impressed with the book. It has all the dramatic elements for a screenplay. It was a bit of a challenge to do it because it was written in the, premier, in the first person. And we asked me and the screenwriter, we asked, do we want to put a voice over in order for us to get inside the protagonist's head? But then we find out that there was other ways we could do to avoid the, not that I'm against the voiceover, I like voiceovers, but we felt maybe we gotta give it a chance to try to do that without voiceover. 
So we went and we did this film. And we knew from the beginning that it's going to be a hard sell. But, you know, you, you don't think only about the marketing. About, you, know, you don't think, should I do a film that sells or not? But I could tell you, in all modesty, I've done two films before, done in foreign languages, and I've always gotten U.S. distribution. Sony Classic distributed my other films. So I knew that, that we probably stand a good chance to have this film released, and it was actually now Focus Features and Cohen are distributing it. Am I happy with it? I am very happy with the film because we took it to a different direction. When the author, Yasmina Kadrai, invited him to come a few months ago to see the film, I knew he was going to be his maid because I completely changed. <laughs> it's, I mean, you know, I changed his ending and we screened it. I was just a bit nervous because I, he's a great author, a very respectable guy, and he trusted us with the book. He didn't get involved in the writing. He didn't have a first or last look. Just take it and and when somebody trusts you, you want to be able to reciprocate this. So he saw the film and then we went out and said, can you roll me a cigarette? I rolled it. I knew I was in trouble when he says, can you roll me a cigarette? <laughs> so he looked at me and he says, why did you change my ending? And that went on for a while and I didn't need to discuss it because he, he had a great ending in the book. But we couldn't do it in the film because the film has to take its own, its own path. And now he's very fine with it, so I'm, I'm happy with the way it turned out at the end. Okay. What was the question? What, <laughs> what, uh, what, what precipitated wanting to make the film, and are you, do you feel as if the constraints of the international marketplace right now, if that allowed you to fully realize the film you originally saw, or did it become something else along the way? Did it kind of take on a, a life of its own because of all of the hurdles. I called the translator for that. <laughs> <laughs> a call to a friend. Um, I never think about the market when I make a film. I just uh, think about my idea, what I want to do, my, uh, what is necessary for me. And I think that if it's necessary for me, it can be necessary for many people. So all the the shot I do in a film, it's uh, I never think about the, the market. It's my uh, only my dream, uh, which is my my uh, my goal. And the, given the, the constraints, the way that, that filmmakers have to deal internationally now. I mean, this is this is sort of the the. Uh, when we talk about with financing, you know, American films very often they'll have a giant pile of money thrown at them that studios can compile even from other sources. Whereas, as in many of these cases, you have to go and kind of dig up financing and attach talent from certain countries. Did that force you to make any compromises, or did it give you any kind of magical accidents that uh, that wound up benefiting in the end? How did how did how was that process? To be honest, I make no compromise at all. So. It, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean I don't think about the public but because all the time I think about that I I want to create emotion so all the time and when I write the script uh, I ask to myself what is the best way for creating strong emotion and uh, it's very important for me because it is a popular heart for me it's what I think so I always think about that about you uh, and um, I know it's much more easy to, to make a film with a movie star. So in my film, I do a very famous actor, but I have a low budget. <laughs> Maybe it, uh, it depends on the, it is because of the subject for the last film. I, I think it was, um, I did five films and all the time it was difficult to, to find the money. And um, it's not a it's not big, big budget. But at the end, I know that at the beginning, the market doesn't want my film. And after, when the film is finished, uh, the market wants my film. And we had, with quite, in many, uh, three of my five films, it's a great success in France. So, I have to follow my way, and they will follow me after. <laughs> well said. I think we, we got the pretty much the story on the man who laughs. 
essentially. I mean, did, are you are you do you feel like um, it, the 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 film that resulted it was in any way um, shaped by those financial factors, by distribution factors? Did that wind up forcing you to make uh, decisions that you might otherwise not have had to make? L'homme qui rit, c'est particulier parce que c'était un peu le, le rêve de ma vie. Hein. J'ai passé à faire ce film depuis euh, que je l'ai lu, donc dans mon adolescence. C'est un rêve de ma vie, vous savez, j'ai rêvé de faire ce film depuis que je l'ai lu, 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 depuis que je l'ai lu. Ça a été très long à faire, très long de trouver un producteur qui, qui, qui ait le courage et l'envie de se lancer dans ce projet. So it was very long, of course, to make and also to find a producer who had the strength and the courage to throw himself into that kind of project. Mais je n'ai jamais lâché, et je crois que c'est ce que nous faisons tous, hein, c'est notre travail, hein, sur euh, ce désir-là, de le tourner, par exemple, intégralement en studio, comme ces, ces, ces films fantastiques américains ou les contrebandiers de Moonfleet que j'aimais tant. Je n'ai jamais transigé avec ça. Je n'ai jamais, je n'ai jamais donné. Et je vais je ne sais plus. Et je voulais vraiment atteindre mon rêve de le faire dans le style américain, tout en studio. Voilà. Parce que beaucoup de gens, bien sûr, me disaient que ce serait tout de même plus simple de le tourner en décor naturel, dans des vrais châteaux. Et, 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 et moi, voilà, c'était l'idée d'un film intégralement en studio et sur la féerie et sur la théâtre. So yeah, I wanted to do it um, like in a studio instead of like a lot of people said why don't you do it like you know in houses and farms and a real castle and stuff and he said no 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 I want to do it in a studio because there's an element of magic in it. Etienne, uh, um, thoughts? Yeah. For me, I put it, put it to, to get involved with uh, gods and men in a more you know, light subject and uh, in fact uh, uh, it was also the meetings of people I mean it's very important when you, you proceed into you know movie making that you, you met some people who inspired you and uh, in this film uh, the, 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 the base because it's based on a true story the, the meeting with Daniel Delpeu who, who was uh, the cook is uh, cook for the president uh, of the Republic and also the meeting with Christian Vincent who is the director which I love the film before and also, because he's a great cooker, he, he, li he likes lo and loves to cook, we, we decided to, to, to make the film. So it was really to, to, to have something, uh, you know, about pleasure, about, uh, about uh, that's also, life is also that, you know, so it's important to, to give that. And, and when, you, when you make some film, I think it's important to give some pleasure and to receive it back. So I think it's quite the same when uh, um, somebody's cooking. So it's, uh, it's, um, yeah. for this film it was that, and next film it will be another one, another thing. Um, well, with, with my film uh, Cycling with Molière, I wanted to, to pay my tribute to the actors, and my love for the actors. It's not because Lambert is here. Sometimes I'm very irritated by actors at the same time. They, they, they make you pay the, the desire and the love you have for them. And <laughs> no, you didn't. That's right. And, uh, and of course, the the wedding of theatre and cinema is like an impossible wedding because when when theatre comes along, it destroys the cinema illusion. And uh, in a strange way, I think I managed to combine the two, having two actors rehearsing a, a, a single scene of Molière, and. Uh, and it was fun to, to get rid of the plot. Because you, when, when you make a film, suddenly you have to get, take care about the plot and uh, the third act and all these, you know, threads that, that you have to follow. Uh, I'd rather talk about a story and, and a story of two human beings being faced together. And that's Lambert and the film. And, uh, well, ultimately it was pretty well received in France. I'd like to skip to Danielle, and then I have some uh, final questions for our two actors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, I'm not ready. <laughs> uh, well, I guess uh, I, I was a screenwriter for a large, large part of my life before I started directing films, and I was, I was, I was always working, of course, for a director and, and 
trying to melt into his world instead of mine and bringing him as much as I could for his film. And so uh, being a screenwriter is, 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 is a wonderful uh, work which I did all my life and I, and I love it more than anything. And um, it, I, it gave me the opportunity to work with uh, directors that had such different ways of, of, of filming and, and, different, uh, and such different films. Comic films, big, big comic films with my father, who, who directed some of the, the, the most, uh, uh, I suppose, the most uh, uh, popular films in France ever. Uh, and they were really, truly, just simply very comic films. Then, comedy, which is another kind of, 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 of film, of course, uh, and, and always make a difference between comic films and comedies. Uh, and all tragedies like for Queen Margot or, or other films that I did. So at one point when I started suddenly thinking, well, maybe I'll make a film myself and what would it be? Uh, the answer was I'd like to mix both. And, uh, and this is what I keep on trying to do, which is that I try to imagine subjects where I can speak about death, hospitals, lies, betrayal, um, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, uh, you know, all these, you know, religion, misunderstanding, judgment, and tolerance, all these things, but I like to make comedies, so I try to bring into my comedies all these ingredients and hoping people will laugh and, and yet come out of the movie having heard a little music that goes a little bit further than just just that. So again this time, uh, that's what I tried to do and I tried to, it came really from the fact, uh, as one of you was saying earlier, that you know, you, you, you actually should always speak about your own village. It happens that my own village is Central Bay, <laughs> where, <laughs> where the families had a house for a long, long time. And it's true that village is very beautiful, uh, very quiet, becomes completely insane for a couple of months every year, and, and has such different ways of actually of be, of, of being lived in. And, and I thought it was a wonderful metaphor for a family who, who uh, you know, has these two brothers who are uh, a way of, dis of, of describing the film. There are many, many characters in the film, so you can actually start telling the story of, of each of them. But these two brothers, I thought it was a good idea to have one, one of them playing in, in a classical concert and the other one in a, in, on a boat with, with, with pretty horrible music. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so it started from there, and my ideas were always very small at the beginning, and then after that there's a lot of work on the screenplay to, to, to try and carry all these uh, subjects that I talked about before. So this is how it started, and this is, this is how this film happened. Uh, Lambert, um, I, I don't know how you have managed to not age since 1985 when I first saw you in Rendezvous, <laughs> but it, it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, and specific to the two films it, that we have here this year, one, in one of which you play yourself, they both have something in common. They both have a theatrical element to them, um, both Moliere and, and uh, the René film. Uh, you're playing an actor in both of them, one of them, you are the actor yourself, but your father ran the, uh, the National Theatre in Paris, and uh, I assume that the theatre runs very deeply in your, in your veins, and is there something that, uh, that you connect to, because this seems to bring the theatre back in touch with the film, and even though Philippe said it's, a, it's, it's kind of an awkward marriage, uh, somehow you, you play the, both of those parts with the same level of conviction and the same level of passion, yet they're completely different. Could you talk just for a moment about that? Um, someone in London asked me when we presented the film whether uh, it was difficult to um, mix theatre with cinema, whether it implied a different sort of acting, and I, I don't think it does, really. I mean, I think that acting is the same on, you know, I mean, it really, it's not a, it's not a stylistic difference for me. I, I have to say that theatre was so familiar in my uh, upbringing because I was four when I went to see plays by 
Bertolt Brecht and uh, you know Corneille and uh, you know and I was laughing with the audience to be cool you know because I wanted I wanted to be part of the adults you know so I was uh, watching these incredibly difficult plays, but I fell in love with the notion of acting through cinema. So cinema was always my obsession, and I listened to my father's advice, which was that actors, even screen actors, had to get a, a good stage training, and so therefore I became a stage actor, and I spent a lot of my energy doing theatre, but uh, cinema was always my, my great, great passion. Uh, it, is, it is weird that uh, in, uh, I am presenting two, two films that uh, uh, involve uh, a play. One of them I actually performed on stage, Eurydice, which is presented in the uh, Alain René film, I actually played for six months with the actress Sophie Marceau. Um, so it's 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 uh, but it's, it's it's not a technical difficulty. I didn't think that it was a technical difficulty. There's just one thing that I wanted to add, which has nothing to do with the, the subject of theater, but it has some, something to do with this, the notion of market. And as far as French actors are concerned, we ha live a paradox. I find that um, a lot of films are being made in France. It's true, and we are very lucky that we have an industry that is still so alive. And at the same time, um, I feel a little sad sometimes that only a very small percentage of our films get um, distribution outside of, um, of France. I mean, yes, we are very much supported, including by a, a state agency, uh, Unifrance, which helps the promotion of French films. However, the, the percentage of French films being distributed outside in the rest of the world is very small. So. I envy American actors who are in vehicles that actually spread throughout the world and um, can be seen. Um, sometimes our efforts are remain a little too closed in uh, within France. Um, and it's, it's a strange paradox because at the same time some French films have been incredibly um, universal, but it's a very, very small percentage. So um, I just wanted to say this, you know, that... Um, the world ignores sort of 95% of our work. That's the trouble. That's what I feel. It's, it, no, it's a valid point. And I think part of it is that our, we've had a crisis of distribution over the last about eight or nine years. A lot of the companies that used to routinely acquire and distribute French language films rather widely with very substantial marketing budgets in the United States, a lot of those countries went away. A lot of those companies went away. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult right now for those films to get the same exposure. A film like The Untouchables would have made five, six, seven, eight times as much as it did um, if we were ten years ago. So I think that's a, that's a valid point. Hopefully that, that void will be filled. Um, Lou, I'd, I'd like to ask you our, our last question um, and put enormous pressure on you because you are the next generation of, uh, of France's uh, great actors. And it's a, it's a tremendous um, history. It's a tremendous heritage. If we, we look at the great cinema countries of the world, um, it's you know France, the United States, Italy, and and England, and uh, maybe Germany, and certainly on some level Japan, and it's and it it kind of ends there. And um, could you talk just for a second about what, if any, if if you look to the past of uh, the great French films and great French actresses who've come before you? And if you see that uh, the future is in some way different for you, or do you, do you see French film, at least as you experienced it growing up, continuing in the same proud tradition? Or is it going to become something different for you? <laughs> I, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, five parts to one question. Alors, euh, déjà, je préfère ne pas trop me, me projeter ou me rêver à un futur, parce que je me dis que si ça, ça arrive jamais, euh, je serais bien frustrée, bien triste. First of all, I am very careful about projecting a future for myself, because I just think if it doesn't quite happen the way I see it, I would be too sad. Et après, quand on prend les actrices françaises, elles ont toutes des carrières très différentes, parce que si on prend par exemple une... When you take a French actress, you know, it's difficult, because they're all extremely different. For example, 
Marina Hans qui joue dans, dans Jacques Lou. For example, my co-star uh, in Jacques Lou, Marina qui a une euh, carrière qui est vraiment euh, surtout française, qui euh, voilà, est au cinéma et au théâtre, euh, mais qui pour moi est une très grande comédienne. Et si je pouvais avoir une carrière comme ça, ce serait parfait. For example, she had a career as well in cinema and in stage, uh, a great career. And if I could have a career like she had, for me, that would be perfect. Et après, il y a aussi des Marion Cotillard qui, elles, sont carrément euh, internationales et ça fait rêver aussi, mais... And then you have like Marion Cotignard, who succeeded to have a very international career, and that makes you dreams as well. Mais chacun fait son chemin. Mais... But you know, everybody has its own path. <laughs> and she's wondering if there was another part of your question that she well, hasn't the, addressed. Well, the, uh, it's a convoluted question. My, my, my thinking was basically, and this is kind of the final point, is, is um, the history of foreign actors in Hollywood is a, is, a, is a difficult one because many of them came here and they had great careers and many would come and it didn't really hit for them and they'd go straight home again. And uh, they'd have extremely prosperous careers back home again. And an actor's career is not always up to them. So um, 